about all the issues with cognition and behavior. And we're going to start out with my two colleagues, uh, Dr. Natasha Akshamoff and Dr. Sarah Matson, who, as you know from the other night in our little history lesson, joined us in 2006. And uh, I really don't know quite how to express my gratitude, and I know that's on behalf of all of you, for the enormous number of hours uh, and resources that Sarah and Natasha have devoted to your children. Um, they have never to this day asked me for anything in return. Um, and I have a little token of appreciation besides our bottles of wine. Each time when we meet to go over data, one of the highest or biggest challenges is we have to figure out where we're going to get our coffee from. So um, if both of you might want to come up here, I have a little way of addressing at least that problem is a little compensation for each of you. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Gift card to Pete's Coffee Shop, my favorite coffee shop in San Diego. <laughs> and I got a free cup of coffee for each certificate, for each gift card. So, <laughs> and Dr. N uh, Natasha Akshamoff, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry in the Center for Human Development at UCSD. She is a pediatric clinical neuropsychologist. Her current research focuses on brain and neuropsychological development, their genetic associations and how these factors are associated with variations in academic skills in children. She is currently leading a longitudinal study on children who were born uh, significantly preterm as they enter kindergarten. She's also involved in a variety of projects that aim to improve early identification and diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders in children and the behavioral phenotypes associated with rare genetic uh, syndromes. So you can see what a great fit both these individuals are for this group. Dr. Akshamoff is actively involved in autism services, very active player in the clinical community here, and uh, she does pediatric neuropsychological assessments here at Rady Children's Hospital. She teaches seminars on neuropsychological development and developmental disorders and provides clinical and research supervision for graduate students and fellows. Here at UCSD. Uh, as Paul and Sarah have told you, uh, we have been doing these assessments for several years and um, I was asked to join the team in 2008 because um, I believe there had been one family that Paul had talked with where uh, they had said that somebody uh, had given their child a diagnosis of autism or there was a question about autism um, in a child with Jacobson syndrome. and. Um, and so we've been trying to sort of more systematically evaluate this and better understand how that might be a part of the syndrome. And I also want to say that I've been seeing children with autism for a very long time and our understanding of this disorder has changed dramatically and my own feelings about the disorder have changed quite a bit um, in part also from seeing uh, children with Jacobson syndrome where there's a specific genetic deletion and a wide range of behaviors associated with that. So it's helped me and I think many other researchers uh, to understand and in turn hopefully I've um, been able to provide some information that's been useful for families uh, to better uh, get services for their children. So first off, I'm going to just give you a little bit of an overview into what we, how we define autism and our definition has changed quite a bit. Um, and many people when they think about autism or autism spectrum disorder as it's called more commonly today, uh, think about children who, for whom there is no other known cause for why the child might be having difficulties, developmental and behavioral difficulties. Um, autism has been defined historically on the basis of behavior and in particular uh, three key elements of behavior that are affected. Social interaction being the most um, primary area of difficulty or weakness, communication difficulties and challenges as well as restricted repetitive behavior. Um, but when we talk about children with autism or an autism spectrum disorder, there's a wide range of how these behaviors are affected and, um, and how these difficulties change over the life course of the child with autism. So I think that that's important to, to think about. Um, and many people who are in the field who specialize in working with children with autism say that you know there's so much variability across kids, it's oftentimes hard to sort of say that 
that they all have the same diagnosis. And I think that that can, that can be very confusing, not only for parents, but also for teachers and clinicians as well. Um, so we see that in terms of social interaction skills, some children may be very withdrawn and um, are sometimes described as sort of living in a world of their own, having um, very limited initiation of social interaction or interest in social interaction. But more commonly, um, particularly as children get older and as they get more services and if they're higher functioning, we see a, quite a bit of range in that. And I feel like many children with autism um, have interest and certainly have lots of attachment to people that they're close with, but they have difficulty primarily in initiating social interactions and maintaining those social interactions appropriately. Um, this has a pretty widespread effect on development and behavior. So communication is primarily used for social interaction. Um, many children with autism communicate in some way to get their needs met, um, but they have more difficulty expressing um, their thoughts and feelings and understanding thoughts and feelings from other children. Some children or many children with autism may not have any functional communication skills. So we, again, we see quite a range of development development and behavior. And the third area is restricted and repetitive behavior, which many people are aware of when they think of a child with autism. They think of a lot of self-stimulatory types of behaviors, which may be motor mannerisms, um, as well as having very highly um, fixated sorts of interests, sometimes on things that are fairly appropriate for children at certain ages, um, and for other children, um, unusual in their focus, and certainly unusual in their intensity, and oftentimes with the exclusion of other kinds of interests and behaviors. Um, in terms of the uh, current criteria for autism spectrum disorder, you don't need to know all of these details, but, but our understanding um, has changed and therefore our definition has changed for how we define autism spectrum disorder these days. Um, and this is the new criteria where what we're looking for is a child who has clinically significant persistent difficulties in social communication and interactions um, in all th these in these three ways. So difficulties in nonverbal and verbal communication as they're used for social interaction. We oftentimes think of poor eye contact, limited gesture use, limited facial expression for social interactions, um, as well as difficulties in verbal communication, using speech at all, as well as how the child might use speech to communicate with others. Um, a lack of social reciprocity or probably more specifically or um, more a better definition might be difficulties with that back and forth of social interactions. Um, and as children get older, having difficulty with maintaining peer relationships appropriate to their developmental level. So another thing that's important to keep in mind is that this all needs to be kind of couched within the context of how is this child doing in terms of their development? What might be your expectations, not purely on the basis of the child's age, but also where they are in terms of their cognitive um, and adaptive behavior skills compared to other children their age, and how might these be different from what you would expect um, within that context. And then, as I said, we look for um, repetitive behaviors, interests, and activities. And the child has to have at least two of these sorts of difficulties. Um, and with the new, oops, sorry, um, with the new definition for ASD, um, an, a, an one area that's been included has been um, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. This was not part of the definition of autism before. Um, but we see it very commonly in lots of children with autism where they may have a great aversion to uh, sensory input like um, particularly auditory stimuli or tactile stimuli and then in the same child you may also see that they seek out a lot of sensory stimulation um, looking at things very um, wanting to hear repetitive sorts of sounds over and over again, seeking out um, deep pressure, pressure stimulation, etc., sort of, um, which is a little bit confusing. Why would you have an aversion to sensory input as well as seeking out? And I think that it probably reflects difficulty with regulating um, how sensory input is being uh, sort of. Uh, 
tuned in the brain and how the child has to sort of modulate these things in unusual ways because their, their nervous system isn't doing it in the way that they're expected. Um, one of the great challenges, however, is that we see a lot of these sorts of difficulties in many children with different types of developmental conditions. And so there's been great confusion in terms of, you know, does everybody sort of meet criteria for autism if you sort of look at these things? Um, or how can we look at these a little bit more specifically? Um, and uh, we see that there are um, quite a range of, this is just some pictures of some of the common sorts of difficulties that children may have. So we expect when children are interacting with others that they'll have um, appropriate eye gaze, um, pointing, gestures, etc. And some children may have more unusual types of interests. Some of the other issues that we see in children with autism, um, again, are common to lots of developmental conditions. So difficulties with temperament. Um, many kids have trouble with motor planning or fine motor skills. A lot of children have trouble learning to imitate, which of course has sort of a, leads to a cascade of difficulties. If you don't imitate others, then it's hard to learn from others. We see a lot of children have anxiety um, and avoidance, and probably because they find lots of different sorts of environments um, difficult to, to navigate and, um, and, and provide a lot of discomfort to them. Difficulties with adaptive behavior skills and, and common intellectual disability in kids with autism. So we know that um, autism is a neuro neurodevelopmental disorder that's defined completely on the basis of behavior um, and therefore there's no sort of biological test for it. Um, it has to be defined on the basis of um, clinical observations and, um, and a lot of experience. We assume that autism is um, really the result from a whole variety of different causes. Um, and as I said, many kids with autism, there's no known cause as to why the child is having these difficulties, but we know that there's a strong genetic component. And in studies where they've looked at genetic differences for children who have autism, um, there have been hundreds of genes that have been implicated to date. Um, not necessarily in terms of deletions, but um, in variations in how those genes are expressed and we of course don't necessarily know what those genes are necessarily important for in terms of development of the brain and behavior and other sorts of functions. So there's a lot of diversity in presentation across children with autism and probably because there's many different causes and even with children who have the same underlying genetic variations we see a lot of variation in how those children may function. So why study autism and Jacobson syndrome? Um, we've seen elevated rates of autism and other types of chromosome deletion syndromes. And um, therefore, it's, it's worthy to sort of see to what degree this may be associated with Jacobson syndrome. Um, in other types of chromosomal deletion syndromes that have also had some common characteristics with Jacobson syndrome, some researchers have warned that if you only rely on a parent report measure, that this can lead to um, high rates of identification of autism that may not necessarily be accurate. Um, and so in order to really better define this, um, we've taken this approach where we've not relied simply on the parent report questionnaires that we obtained from you, um, but, um, but I've been the clinical expert who's been seeing the children individually and in some cases following them over time to see what are the behaviors that we see in children with Jacobson syndrome and how might those um, match what we see in the sort of this broad definition of autism spectrum disorder. So what we've done recently is we've pulled together the data um, that we've collected through these conferences um, in 2008, 2010, and 2012. And we've only, um, what I'm going to talk about today is just the data from um, 17 individuals who had a pure distal 11Q deletion. These children ranged in age from 3 to 21. Um, we also included in a paper that's um, going to be um, coming out for publication pretty soon in genetics and medicine, um, an additional three cases of um, children that we saw um, as part of the study um, as an interesting kind of comparison. Prior to the testing that I did individually with the children, uh, the parents completed the social communication questionnaire, which was designed to be a screener for looking at those sorts of behaviors that are associated with autism. Um, but as I said, the, the questionnaires are not 
perfect. So in some cases, a child might get a high score on this questionnaire, but clinical assessment may not necessarily confirm the behavioral characteristics that we're looking for, and vice versa is also true. Um, as part of the assessment, what we've done is we've pulled, we've taken together the cognitive testing um, for children who have uh, very limited skills. Uh, it's not advisable to necessarily accurate, you can, it's hard to make an accurate diagnosis of autism because of limited um, behaviors and the, the tests haven't been designed for children with very low functioning, so we've taken that into consideration. Um, also their adaptive behavior skills and then a standardized assessment of autism symptoms, the autism diagnosis diagnostic observation schedule. Um, and in a couple of cases, we weren't able to do that, and so I did a standardized, very long interview with the parents um, to get information about their child's development and behavior. And what we found in this collection of 17 children that we saw is that eight of those individuals met criteria using this kind of research diagnosis approach um, for autism spectrum disorder, so um, nearly half the children. Um, it's interesting that we had, of these 17, only five of them were boys, the majority were girls, and four out of five of the boys met criteria for autism spectrum disorder. Um, but we also found um, a, a a high rate, obviously, of um, girls who had autism. And autism is less common in girls than in boys. Um, and so the rate is definitely higher than we would expect just pulling to um, children from the general population. We also had these three additional cases, two boys and one girl, um, we didn't include them in our main, main analysis because one had already had an outside diagnosis of autism and was then found to have 11Q deletion. Um, two of these children had interstitial deletions, not um, terminal deletions, and one, had, one of those kids had already been evaluated outside and found to have autism spectrum disorder. So those three additional cases we also um, found to have autism in this particular sample. Um, oh, the rate of autism in the females was 33%. Um, so that was rather unexpected. Um, certainly the results indicate that the features of autism spectrum disorder um, are fairly common amongst children with Jacobson syndrome, but there's a lot of variability um, across the sample. And, um, and I'm still, uh, you know, try to be sort of as conservative as possible. There are some cases that I, I sort of am on the, on the fence about a little bit um, because of some of the other characteristics that we see in children with Jacobson syndrome and I think make it a little bit more confusing. Um, some of the things that I've noticed, for example, is that um, many children that we see have uh, more limited use of um, eye contact or um, they have not only, I think, some physical visual disturbance issues that make it hard for them to regulate their eye contact appropriately for social interactions. Um, I've also noticed in, in many of the children that I've seen that there are difficulties with their facial uh, musculature. So they have very limited uh, facial expression. Their facial expression is often fairly flat. And these are, so, these are these sorts of skills that we use in social interactions. So if you're rating somebody in terms of their eye contact and their facial expression for regulating social interactions, many children with Jacobson syndrome are going to, going to you know, have high ratings in terms of failure to do these things. Um, and, and I don't know to what degree that helps to uh, sort of change the development of their social interaction skills or are just part of this complicated disorder. I want to just spend a couple minutes um, talking a little bit about interventions for autism. Many of you may be familiar with these things. I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about them, and I think that we're going to have a um, uh, Mrs. Facchetti is going to talk about um, some behavioral interventions tomorrow perhaps, or today. Um, so I'm not going to steal her show. Um, but, um, but it occurs to me, um, particularly because we've had a couple families where we've told them that we thought that this, this seemed to be an important component of their child's development, and by getting these types of services have had pretty positive effect on their child's ability to make more progress. Um, I sort of have this personal feeling that lots of children with a variety of developmental um, needs can benefit from these same approaches. Unfortunately, the way our healthcare system is that in many places um, they may not be made available to children who don't have a diagnosis. Um, but they're not, they're not sort of 
secret or, or magic. So um, I think that there are avenues for, um, for trying to get these sorts of services provided for your children if you think that they may be helpful. So currently our interventions for autism are really primarily behavioral um, as well as developmental. We look at, we try to develop the child's um, relationships with their parents, with their peers, to their teachers, etc. And many kids benefit from more visual types of strategies for helping to scaffold their behaviors. Um, for many kids with autism, there's a more comprehensive program that's used um, to build together all the kinds of services that they may receive, like speech therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral interventions, and educational strategies, where all therapists are sort of on the same page and trying to use the same approaches that, that may um, work best for, um, for these children. Um, so you may have heard about applied behavior analysis or ABA. Um, ABA is really um, is the form of treatment that's used for many kids with autism and has the most sort of scientific um, validation uh, or uh, research behind it for being effective for children with autism and, and children and adults. Um, with autism and based on a real behavioral model um, which is basically from the s science of psychology called applied behavior analysis um, and the development of those behavioral treatments for autism really rose out of this field of science of using specific types of behavioral approaches particularly the types of behaviors that you want to enhance or increase figuring out what are the kinds of reinforcers that you can use to promote the development um, and continued um, growth of those sorts of skills, as well as alternative approaches for decreasing problem behaviors. Um, so the types of techniques that um, clinicians use, usually they use a variety of techniques, but you'll hear about discrete trial training, pivotal response training, particularly here in California, and a picture exchange communication system. As the woman earlier today said, um, for some kids using sort of these little pictures may not necessarily work very well for their child. Um, they may need more um, sort of fancy um, stimulation, so lots of therapists are now turning to using videos as well as iPads pads and other ways to try to basically enhance the child's attraction towards communicating or ability to communicate with other people um, to not only get their needs met but also to have more meaningful social interactions. Um, also, people use things like more floor time, particularly with younger children, to really enhance their communication skills and their play skills, um, as well as schedules, because many kids have trouble with being flexible. So if you can warn the child ahead of time, here are the things that we need to do, first this, then that, it can be much more helpful for particularly decreasing temper tantrums. Um, one important message is that you know our the, there isn't a huge amount of literature on this, but the, the literature that we have to date says that for kids with autism in general, the most favorable outcomes come when these sorts of programs are started as early as possible and are implemented more intensively as children get older. Um, and so I would say that if you have certain concerns about your child, um, it's better to try to get those services um, put in place um, through the community and to the schools as, as best you can. Um, and um, as I said, what we try to do is to build together these services, not only for educational purposes, but for developing the child's social skills, um, their daily living skills, so that they have more independent types of skills, and to um, promote personal safety among um, the children that we see. So that's all that I have for, for my talk. Thank you. Um, questions or comments? Yes. Any live stream questions? Cindy, were, were there any live stream questions? Uh, no. Okay, so we can take a few now and then again we'll have the uh, panel discussion this afternoon. So. Hi. Thank you, Natasha. Mm -hmm. I am wondering um, for those of us who have children that do not qualify for a diagnosis but do show many of these traits. Do you have any suggestions on, um, I have been denied from receiving ABA services. Um, I come from that same school of thought that our kids could all benefit from this. Is there anything that you can leave for us or suggest, like what can we do at home or um, to advocate for these services for our kids? 
Yeah, um, I think that probably one of the most important approaches is to try to utilize those sorts of approaches um, in the home. And if there is some type of parent-based training that you can receive, even if it's pretty limited, we have a we have a. Um, an approach that we use in our clinic where parents and children come in for eight to 12 or so sessions um, and the behavior therapist works with them with basically sort of teaching them these sorts of techniques and so the idea being that you will then be able to serve as your best, your child's best therapist as well as advocate for getting them through the day, enhancing their skills um, and sort of having an understanding of what sorts of approaches work best for your child at this point in their development as they're interacting with other therapists and educators, etc. Um, so it's hard when those aren't available to you through the typical means, like through the social services agencies or even through insurance. But um, but one possibility might be if you can find behaviorally oriented therapists that are psychologists, in particular, where your insurance might pay. So it's not necessarily ABA for kids with autism, but a therapist who knows those sorts of techniques. Techniques, um, we find that we're ab I'm, I'm able to get those sorts of services through that approach through insurance without you know using the word autism in some cases but I can talk to you more about that too but I think that's a really good point of you know if you've been denied those services um, and the other thing that I think we're trying to advocate or help to explore a bit more is that for children that have a specific medical diagnosis might that be an argument for getting access to these sorts of services versus children who don't have a specific diagnosis, you know, they have developmental delay where unfortunately the insurance company might be able to deny it a little bit more easily. Yes? Uh, I, I just have two questions. Uh, you mentioned one of the criteria is uh, stereotype motor or verbal behaviors. Can you explain what that means? So the kinds of characteristics that we see um, are things like a lot of hand flapping, spinning, um, stacking things over and over again, fascination with water. Um, for some children who have very limited speech, repeating things over and over again. Um, the kind of classic for many kids with autism is that we see children who have this very stereotyped speech where they can repeat whole sentences and yet they don't use them meaningfully in their day-to-day -day lives. So um, that had in the past been sort of put over with language and communication, but it really seems to go together with this kind of repetitive type of behavior. Now the caveat is that lots of children when they're young particularly kids who have more significant developmental delays, engage in a lot of that type of repetitive behavior. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's something that shouldn't necessarily be addressed because what we try to do is to promote more appropriate types of behaviors, you know, decrease the repetitiveness, help the child to be more flexible and engage in a wider variety of skills. So that's what we mean by that. Thank you. My sure. other question had to do with social reciprocity. Um, my daughter doesn't have any problem with reciprocity, but Yes. Yeah. So we see, particularly in in higher functioning children, we see that kind of range where you know um, some children may be more withdrawn, some children may be very passive, and some children may be overly social, inappropriately social. And so trying to get them to understand what are the boundaries, what are the social boundaries, um, and also you know being aware of the sort of safety concerns with that of being you know, a little bit too friendly with strangers is important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have a question about um, how to activate for my child. We have a wonderful service in Montana for autism. They're just doing a huge... Now, I've been told because my child is labeled Jacobson syndrome, he can't participate in the autistic one. I have to pick one. I'm don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, is there a way to let my child be involved in this, in all these other availabilities? Um, so are these primarily kind of clinical services yes. or more recreational types so of services? Clinical and um, they have 
they work with the children on a daily basis. Uh -huh. um, and I know many children that are involved in that, but I was told that his main label is not autism. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a label for him. He is my son. <laughs> right. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk with you further about that. I think that we might be able to, to help, you know, maybe write a letter and sort of say that, you know, that your son would benefit from at least some partial inclusion in this program and that, that we think that this might help advance certain, you know, skills and, and, and is it worth, a, you know, is it, is it possible that he could at least get some benefit from this for a limited period of time? Um, I mean, I can't promise you anything, but, you know, that, again, that's my quandary is I think lots of children would benefit from these sorts of services. There might be other ways to, to get some benefit from them as well. I would suggest you might want to, if you can attend tomorrow evening's session with Chuck oh, Amire, right. um, he might actually potentially give you some options that give you legal leverage. Thank you. Because that's what Chuck does, is advocates from the legal perspective for children with special needs. And to me, that just sounds incredible that because we know the cause, they're actually precluding him for what he needs. Right. Right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, we have similar issues. I mean, you know, you know, because she doesn't have autism, you know, a lot of services are based around autism, and because she doesn't have autism, you know, radically, that, you know, kind of limits services that could be available to her, and they just write it off as, okay, she has a lot to do. That's it. I mean, they don't look any further. Um, I, I know often DCD trumps. Microphone. Anything else? I know that often DCD will trump anything else, including if your child could benefit and or even be diagnosed with autism. If you have the DCD, that will go primary, and that is what programming will follow often. Um, but just always remember, it's, it's an IEP, meaning you can have these services built in, even if it's within a DC classroom placement. So just, just know you don't have to sign anything that doesn't contain those elements of programming. Um, if you believe and you have, um, especially, experts backing up that this kind of program would benefit your child, even with DCD. <laughs> what do you mean by DCD? Developmental cognitive disability. Oh, okay. different things, but often if you have any sort of developmental disability, that would be kind of what districts defer to as the first type of placement, if you will. Um, it just an IEP, you can sign it and help craft it and make it what you need it to be for your child based on what you know of your child and what you've done working with doctors and psychologists to get the services that your kid needs. I want to know the job that I Was there another question on this side somewhere? Oh. Let him bring you the mic. What happens if uh, my uh, grandson is uh, 18? And that more than anything is a social. He can talk, he can, you know, but it's still, he's not at a level he should be to really make him and maintain friendships. What, what, and if you had no uh, helper, at all, you know, up to that point, what can you do after they turn 18? What sources? Uh, are available then. What should you do? What should you do at that point? They're in California, by the way. Oh, um. So one thing would be to, um, if your child's 18, he may still be eligible for services through the school district. Um, the other would be the California Department of, if you're in California, the Department of Developmental Disabilities, and to uh, request an, you know, an evaluation as well as opportunities for social skills, specific social skills types of interventions, recreational opportunities, um, you know, building from what he needs at home as well as out in the community. 
um, and, and also, again, working with private practitioners in the community. But I think through the other service agencies, um, you should be able to request those types of services. Yeah, the regional center is the Department of Developmental Disabilities. So, um, so I would specifically request that those are major concerns that are important for his development um, and how you might be able to have access to those. Okay. Okay. Did Great. you have another question? <laughs> I did. Um, oh, in, in response or to share an experience I had with um, the most recent testing that we participated in with Sarah, I want to thank you as well on that session. Um, when I finally did get the report back, even though you guys didn't have a clinical diagnosis, I was able to take that paperwork to um, our current psychologist and share that information with them, who then set us up with their version of, of the evaluation. Mm -hmm. And um, with that combination, they were able to put autism spectrum disorder in her clinical diagnosis with Jacobson, and it opened up the doorway to get those extra insurance benefits and then use that clinical diagnosis to share with um, the adult, because we're, she's 26, with her adult um, educational services and regional center and got that door opened as well to get the behavioral um, services and she did that for a year and a half afterwards and that was as an adult, which apparently is really rare to right. get the services that way, so that might be another option. Right, great. Lindsay, do you trade places with you? Okay. All right, we just want to thank uh, both you and Sarah for all of your efforts. We can't adequately thank you for all you've done for our organization um, and for us as parents. Your research means so much to us, um, and we appreciate you guys being here. We appreciate you guys seeing our kids, and um, we just have a little token of appreciation for coming and speaking to us today. Thank you. Thank you.